So this talk is about, um, <clears throat> for this embedded session, this uh, Java robotics and automation uh, using as the general purpose uh, robotics and automation software platform. I've been here coming to Java for a while um, and um, I, yeah, I know in 2006 we had like one of our autonomous ground vehicles here and, and over the years we've had other weird um, creations and uh, this year in a, in a session that I'm giving tomorrow I'm, I actually brought a, a smaller bot that, that is actually more um, programmable by, by, um, by you know, uh, most of us because it's, it's, it's very difficult to procure a, a, f a car and retrofit it and not to mention the dangers. So, um, so this talk is going to focus about the broad um, brush of, of applications that are possible, including things that, that, that we can do as uh, sort of tinkers as, as well as uh, you know, for commercial purposes. So the first part of this, I'm going to talk about the robotics uh, and automation market. First of all, I know this is kind of like a, a this was kind of tagged as a business slash architect se session. How many of you are actually are developers developing day to day? Okay, so about half and then the rest, I assume, architect, business uh, side of things. So I will have some, some sort of pseudo code in here, but I have a session tomorrow which is uh, all code, basically, and I, we've got, got a little robot here that, uh, God willing, will we'll run around and, and do things appropriately. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the robotics market, so I'll talk about that just very quickly. Uh, talk about Java and this complementary <coughs> solution to using Java for building uh, robotics and automation applications faster and, and talk about how some of this has been vetted with some real world examples um, that, I'll, that I'll show you. So we'll go through the market, Java's use, these building blocks. I'll talk a little bit about target environments, hardware, devices, I.O. Um, and some, at the end we'll talk a little bit about benefits and, and some of the uh, pros and cons. So it's always great to have these hockey stick charts um, that show what, what uh, these are put together by um, marketing people after years of, 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 of intense study and they always tend to come up with the same picture which is this hockey stick curve which just shows explosive growth but I actually tend to believe this. Um, these are different outlooks for the robotics uh, and automation market, primarily robotics over the next, um, over the next you know, 10, um, uh, 15 years or so from different groups. This was from I believe the U, uh, UN group that projects that the global market for robotics, um, personal and service robotics, which is actually just a small portion of robotics, um, is going to be at 51 billion by 2025. This group over here from the Japan Robotics Association talks about the total. This doesn't include defense in that number, but uh, 66 billion in 2025. And so you see some of these other projections, and, and none of these really include defense-related robotics, which, as we know, is, is, is also um, uh, uh, an area where they're, they're spending a lot of money. So this is a slide that I sometimes use to make the analogy between popular robotics and popular computing. And, you know, when um, back in sort of the 70s, when, um, when you know, ro uh, computers were first starting to enter the home. Um, you know, we went from these large-scale mainframes that only I industrial organizations or research uh, organizations could afford. And then, you know, in the 70s, we had popular computing. Um, and now, you know, we have computers in the home, in the workplace, uh, in business. Um, and, and it's very pervasive. And you can kind of see the same analogy uh, happening really right about now, now-ish, you're seeing more uh, uh, consumer or, or popular grade robotics, um, uh, you know, in the form of, you know, low cost consumer grade robot vacuum cleaners, lawnmowers, um, uh, iRobot has done a lot in that space. So, so the robotics is sort of making the jump from only uh, from the world where only the large industrial and research organizations could afford to field robots to 
um, something that's more affordable uh, for, for uh, consumer or popular use. And, uh, and that's due to many things, a convergence of process, you know, processor speeds. It's easier to, to put, you know, have more run on a robot now, whereas previously it had to run on a mainframe, the algorithms and, and uh, you know, uh, memory storage and all those Moore's Law artifacts have made this, um, made this viable. So, but there's still some gaps uh, that, you know, and it's, it's still a complex uh, problem. And, and um, when you look at a robotics application, you've got different types of sensors. These are laser sensors here. Um, and um, get myself a little lead here. Um, we've got GPS sensors. That's an antenna on the right. Um, stereo cameras, different types of actuators, different types of embedded processors, program logic controllers, user interfaces. And there's just this gap between you have this application that you want to build and knowing how uh, to, to, to field it. And so you've got a lot of these stovepipe architectures where people will develop um, everything from the ground up for their application. And then, but that doesn't translate necessarily to the next application. And so you've got all these different layers. You've got, you know, communications. But with, with these devices, you have to sense uh, information, uh, maybe make some measurements and analysis, uh, use that to control and actuate motors, spin wheels, turn steering wheels, um, and then at sort of higher levels create these, you know, sequences of actions um, and then, you know, combining those into, for, for like in the mobile robot space, maneuvers. A maneuver is a sequence of actions like a self-parking maneuver. Um, and then coordinating these behaviors. How do you you know, you don't want to be self-parking when you've got forward collision avoidance on the highway. You know, there's some prioritization scheme. And, and so there's coordinating all this and, and, and then creating what is ultimately your application. So there's a big gap in, in going from this, these devices to an actual application. Um, and, there's, and there's a wide target space. You've got all kinds of mobility platforms. Is it skid steer? Is it Ackerman steering based? Is it two wheel, four wheel, six wheel, multi directional? Um, all kinds of sensors, LIDAR, radar, um, um, different types of actuation methodologies, DC motors, stepper motors, servos, control algorithms, um, IO, you know, uh, analog and digital IO processors, you know, are you running on an ARM environment? Are you running in a microcontroller? Can you run in a microcontroller with Java? Um, operating environments, applications, and then there's also another problem with a lot of the times because it's sort of on this cusp of um, crossing the chasm from the research and high, high expense world to the more affordable consumer world, I think you, see, you still see a lot of specialized and proprietary solutions in terms of hardware and I.O. and certainly software uh, and portability. So there's a lot of reinvention. People are building, building from scratch, these stovepipe architectures that I talked about. And it's a complex problem. I mean, the, there's limited tool support. You know, there's a certain level of capability required for, you know, what is SLAM, you know, simultaneous localization. and. Um, and, and mapping, you know, what is that? And, you know, that's not necessarily taught. Uh, it's not something you pick up while, um, while reading, you know, a trade magazine per se. So, so um, there, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, hurdles um, to hurdle. So this, you know, about um, 2001, I started to work um, in, in, on a uh, platform to address some of these gaps and taking this building block solution approach where um, we want to use a high-level object-oriented programming language. Some of the languages that have been used in the, you know, if you were in the 80s or 90s reading about robotics, there were still some proprietary or some, some custom um, non-standard programming practices and languages being used. And so um, not necessarily in every case, you know, leveraging available object-oriented languages. Um, I think it's very important to have a general purpose programming language um, for a lot of different reasons. One, to harness um, uh, existing knowledge. Uh, if you use a, 
language like Java, for example, there's a large community of Java developers, a large community of third party, both open source and commercial source support. Um, and, um, and to have a solution that can also have high, higher level, in addition to the programming language, there's a need for higher level uh, libraries to encapsulate common things that you do across these robotics applications, be they uh, air-based, ground-based, um, um, or just within sort of ground-based vehicles, there's, there's common libraries that, 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 are, that come in handy. So um, that's the building block approach. It also needs to tailor itself for different operating hardware um, and, and operating environments, be independent and scalable, um, and, um, and, and leverage uh, the, and provide you with the ability to talk to these, very, these various devices that, that, that are out there, different lasers and, um, and sensors or different types of sensors. So Java as, a, as the programming language um, in terms of why this is good. Um, some of the um, typical responses for why Java apply here as they apply everywhere, it's high level and it's object oriented and that gets you all of the uh, um, benefits that uh, you know, are rehashed. It's, 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 it's simple to use. It's general purpose, common, commonly, the most com still the most commonly used programming language according to at least one uh, non-Oracle uh, report that I saw. So, um, so I think it's still, it's, it's out there. There are other languages that have gained popularity, but it's still widely, widely popular. Um, and again, wealth available expertise, tools, and portability across operating environments out of the, out of the gate. So here's where um, we look at where Max um, closes a gap, if you will. You've got an application, you know, you want to make a robot go from point A to point B. Well, if you just take the Java libraries as they are, there's nothing in there um, that's going to let you do that, per se. So you have, there's a bunch of code that has to be written, and, um, and you know, we've got common sense plan act code, sort of at this level, we've got specific drivers to, to now plug in, kind of like a printer driver, only you're not, you've got a laser driver, or a, a radar driver, or some other type of, of, of way to tie in a, um, a device. And then higher level frameworks that might be suitable for, that aren't general purpose across all robotics applications, but are general purpose across a subset, like unmanned ground vehicles. Um, you know, so that you wouldn't necessarily have that at the common level here, because you know, that these would be things that don't apply to on manned air vehicles or, 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 or what have you, or even small indoor robots. So this is a crazy slide that I'm going to just get past because it's very, uh, there's a lot here, but, but this, is, this is kind of um, Max also in a nutshell. We've got the architecture, there's a Java virtual machine, our operating systems hardware platform, we runs atop Java. We've got general purpose building blocks. Um, there's this hardware abstraction layer where we, you know, so that we can, uh, you know, talk to different types of sensors without changing application code. It's comprehensively configurable in that just about all the objects can be, can be made to be configurable objects. It is container based. We run it in a, a very lightweight container, but you also can run it as a standard, you know, POJO you know, uh, type uh, programming model where you're just making calls onto these reusable, these reusable objects. Do you have a question or? Yeah, real quick question. Um, so if this is just running on top of a standard JVM and you don't need any, you don't have any requirements for deterministic execution? That's a very good question and that might be a good segue for this next slide because actually you do have, um, no, okay. So you do, we, there is, I do talk about profiles here. There is a, there is a, um, there's a common um, set of libraries that are useful across all platforms, but it represents the lowest common denominator. Um, and you can run in like CLDC, Java ME environments, you can run in SE environments, and you can run in some of the real-time environments. So Java RTS or RTSJ. And those are profiles of it, but they use the common, the common libraries. So um, I just threw this in recently because I thought it was, um, I guess, a, a good way to drive home the pros and cons of building blocks. But this may be 
um, maybe tedious, but so basically without building blocks, what are you doing? You're writing code that's going to send, first you've got to load your RxTx or Java.com, if you can find it, <laughs> a library to be able to write um, some, write a, uh, read a command from a serial port. Because you've got a lot of devices that, still, that you still talk to over serial ports. A lot of these lasers and GPS devices and there's a lot of serial port stuff in the robot world. So, and then you're going to write code to pull and maybe wait for a response, read a header, check the response header for integrity. Um, you're, you're basically packetizing and parsing this thing. Then you're going to read maybe an analog voltage value from it if this sensor represents a, um, a, um, like an infrared sensor that tells you the distance to something. Um, uh, you're going to do some conversions. You're gonna, you might map it to um, some, some voltage value um, because you've got this raw data value. Uh, you're going to uh, manage reading and use, and use of this uh, now as, it, say, it's a, say it's telling you this current steering angle in this example. Um, and you're going to get the difference between the desired and the actual steering angle and then turn a steering wheel in this example based on this difference. So with building blocks, you know, while in a control loop, you're simply invoking something called you know, steering control action, which you know, would be a, um, something in, say, the Max UGV framework library. So you, you, um, you register your, your sensor, you register your, your, your controller, you, tune, you tweak some parameters, and then, and then um, you, know, you don't have to write this tedious control loop and the parsing logic. You can focus on, okay, out of the gate, I'm, I'm turning a steering wheel on an Ackerman-based robot, which may be a car, it may be a small two-wheel or four-wheel device with steerable steering wheels. Um, or you can still roll your own control algorithm. You could just read the steering angle from the sensor. This is what the, you know, what the, what the control module would do. Um, read the steering angle from a sensor, compute the difference between the actual and the desired, and then and invoke a left or right operation on it based on that. So that's an example of how you save time with using building blocks. So this uh, is just rehashing uh, the answer to your question. Um, we've got max common, which is the lowest common denominator across profiles, 90% of of, of code in a p typical application may <clears throat> reside in there. And then we've got some, uh, um, we've got Mac standard for running on SE, real time Java RTS and RTSJ, and Max micro <clears throat> for Java ME and any available targets. You may have some specific targets because there's a lot of non, there's some, you know, non standard things that are still in that space that you need to commonly do. So we've got wrappers around those common things, um, like, uh, like talking to analog inputs, for example. Java ME doesn't have an analog input class or something that, with an adapter model. So we've got that, and we adapt to um, uh, you know, uh, the Agile microprocessor, which is, if you've heard of that, it's a low-level controller, or the fidgets boards, if you've heard of those. Um, so, um, and this is the target embedded hardware that we typically deal with. Of course, x86, uh, increasingly ARM. I just mentioned Agile. They have a really nice um, uh, Java. It's actually a JVM in hardware, um, little microcontroller. Um, there's all kinds of discrete I.O., analog and digital inputs and outputs, relays, periodic pulsed inputs and outputs, and, you know, counters from, from wheel encoders, uh, pulse width modulating or, or, or pulsing, uh, you know, the control of a motor. Um, and then all kinds of I.O., computing I.O. types, like RS-232, it's very popular, Ethernet, CAN, USB, I2C. These are all uh, things that you need to talk to. Ethernet, of course, is embedded in Java. So you've got those libraries um, readily available. But, but um, Java... Java serial ports, for example, is outside of the scope of Java. You know, how, you know, CAN, certainly the industrial Ethernet. So these are all libraries that have to be created outside of the standard Java platform. So, um, and then target operating environments. Uh, we typically, you know, Linux, uh, Windows, and, and, oh, and Mac. So it should be Mac OS X for, um, for development. Um, most commonly, we, we've run on Solaris quite a bit. Um, there's uh, real-time operating environments like Linux, Solaris, QNX, and VXWorks. 
and a bevy of what I call some oddball things that just come our way that can cause misery because we have, you know, it's a customer required platform and we've got to find a JVM vendor who will support it and get them to pay a lot of money or something. So this, this is where we get into the, the, the hard part, too, of, of Java. Same thing with microcontrollers. I mean, you've got a big robotics community out there that likes to take an Arduino, which is a $20 to $40 microcontroller, and, and, um, and within a few hours or a day, they're up and running and able to do something. Well, we should be able to do that in the Java world. Java was designed to be, to be, uh, to span these different these different levels, um, and uh, there are some some there's the uh, some control microcontrollers like from this company Agile. There are some Linux based, um, not really microcontrollers but embedded systems from companies like Pactron, and um, they have an ARM based system and uh, in this in this group Fidgets. Um, uh, and then, again, a bunch of oddball things in this space that you have to deal with. So this is where we spend a lot of time, you know, just trying to, trying to map sometimes our, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll use what, what standard platforms we can use, but depending on certain requirements, we, you know, we end up having to spend extra time working with vendors to, to enable to support these other real-time and, and micro-level environments. And that's, that's where there's some some heartache. Um, and then some uh, driver examples, you know, LIDAR lasers that emit beams and tell you the range to where things are are very popular. Radar, GPS, inertial nav, cameras, RFID. Um, these are all common, uh, 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 common types of sensors that, that, that we support with drivers. Um, and then we've done some frameworks, a couple of frameworks. You know, um, there's m many more that could be done, but we've happened to done a lot of detection and measurement where we're detecting uh, vehicles. Um, a couple years ago, we were here, we were showing you that our project with the Pennsylvania Turnpike, where we're detecting and measuring vehicles using sensors, people, um, and this Max UGV that we used in the DARPA Grand Challenges um, for for unmanned ground vehicle, or in this case, autonomous ground vehicle. Control. So there were some common libraries there. So, um, these slides will be available. I, I have like 50 slides, so I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go through all of them. But um, I'll give you an example here. I think this is an interesting one of, of, of okay, here's, here's what you have to do without a framework. So, um, for self-navigation. So you're going to read a current GPS position from a sensor. Um, then you're going to read the next desired position that you're supposed to go to from some route plan. And then you're going to compute the desired direction um, that you want to go uh, based on the difference between, the, um, between wh where you're currently going um, and, uh, well, wait a minute, well, let me, I'm jumping ahead here. You're going to compute the desired direction from the current desired G GPS point. So there's the desired direction. You're down there, on the, you're down here, and you want to go straight up. And then you want to read your current heading from your inertial nav system, and it's telling you you're going uh, 10 degrees uh, west of north. So you're going to compute this heading distance, and you're going to get a difference from a current and desired direction. You're going to read the current steering angle of your steering wheel in your car, and you're going to compute the steering difference, the difference between um, your current steering angle and where you want to go and you get a heading difference and then you're going to turn the steering wheel left or right based on on this difference and you're not going to gun it all the way left or gun it all the right you're going to put it into a little control loop so it does it smoothly so it gets to that point in time but so with a framework um, uh, for example uh, just via configuration files we associate a position sensor with our nav controls object a route plan with it um, a heading sensor with it, a steering sensor with it, and a steering actuator with it. And in a control loop, um, you know, which is also configured, we, it simply invokes this nav control action. So you can have sort of just using configuration files uh, some self-navigation um, for an application um, quickly. And again, focus on the big things, like for the urban grand challenge and urban challenge, um, we didn't want to spend a lot of time on on you know figuring out which way to turn the steering wheel, we wanted to try to 
get towards the complex things like detecting lines in the road and and um, uh, or uh, you know detection of, of of obstacles and 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 and, and inducing um, maneuvers that 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 enable the robot to handle these wide variety of situations that the bot would encounter. So these are kind of some of the building block benefits, right? You've got rapid robotics and automation development, um, more rapid device and mobility integration, rapid higher level development, um, rapid and scalable hardware integration across different platforms. And, and um, I'll talk a little bit about this towards the end of the, of the talk, but you know, this platform's, we've been working with it for 12 years and so we wanted to prove that it scales <clears throat> from complex to simple applications and, and vice versa and want to run in a wide range of, of, of environments. Um, um, so now I'm going to just go through a couple of these real world examples. Um, first was the 2005 DARPA Grand Challenge. Is everybody, has anybody not heard of it? Or, um, so it's, uh, I guess, well, you know, well known there. With that, that was our, our entry. Tommy, a silver egg shaped dune buggy. For $60,000, um, we built Tommy. <laughs> um, it's probably 10 uh, man months of software development time. So we were on a, we were on a, a tight budget. So um, we, you know, we were competing with, with uh, you know, excellent teams. And, uh, but you know, certainly some teams have had many resources. But so we had to take a different approach of, and, we'll, and really the idea behind us getting involved was to show, hey, we can use this platform to help us um, develop a complex application like this faster, because we're not developing a lot of stuff from scratch. So, um, you know, we did the onboard controls, the steering, the throttle, brake and shift, the GPS and inertial nav-based navigation, and we used LIDAR and radar for, for obstacle detection. Um, and then fu fusing the, you know, we had diffuse the data from a couple different uh, lasers and detect positive obstacles like other cars or negative obstacles like um, cliffs, for example, um, uh, and, and walls and grass <laughs> so that the car wouldn't just sort of stop because there's some high grass. Like, how do you do that? that? That was a bummer. It got stuck on a hay bale. I mean, a lot of people did, but, you know, these are the kinds of things that, that you learn. Um, so that was one application, a lot of fun. Um, well, no, it wasn't. It was horrible. No, no, it was fun. It was, um, it was, uh, a bit, a bit time, cause I think there's a video. Oh, yeah. So anyway, this was Tommy Jr. fielded for, um, the 2005, um, Urban Challenge. This was a long range, um, Longer, long range, high speed AGV city driving challenge. So you're driving um, in, a, in a mock city uh, amongst other cars. You have to detect now the speed and the direction of, of these other, with the Grand Challenge, everything was static. The obstacles didn't move. And the Urban Challenge, things move. So you had to detect not only that they're there, but where they're going and how fast they're going. Because you may have to follow behind them or, or yield to them at an intersection. Um, and know that they got there first and know that they're moving forward to go into the intersection. So um, there's a bunch of different maneuvers, uh, you know, passing vehicles, parking, rerouting, U-turns, um, uh, merging uh, in traffic, and, um, and, and creating an optimal route plan because you're given, it was kind of like um, a little maze. You've got Here's, here's the map of the city, and here are the checkpoints that you've got to get to, and here you are now. Figure out your, your route, and then they'd block your route along the way. This was actually at Java 1 when it was uh, in follow me mode in 2008, maybe? Um, so with James Gosling's uh, keynote, and uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, we idle it low so that in case something went wrong. I'm not talking about safety, but safety is implied in all of this. <laughs> Always have an e-stop button ready. Uh, Linkvolt. So I've had the pleasure to work with uh, Neil Young, rock legend. Um, he's got a, uh, he took a 59 Lincoln Continental um, 
turned it into an extended range electric vehicle. We started to work with him to drop in some controls for gathering telemetry data and, um, and broadcasting that to the web. And as he saw how quickly we could do things in Java, um, um, like literally we'd go to the shop and have stuff up and running quickly. He's, he, got, he started to get interested in finding out more about what, what could be done. And so once, once he found out that we could do autonomous vehicles, he totally glommed onto that and says, yes, we, I, my car needs to be autonomous. So, so we are commissioned, actually, and sponsored by Oracle to, to make that autonomous. And we've done a lot of work. Um, on that, um, the car unfortunately had a fire about two, was involved in a fire two years ago. And so it's, being, it's been rebuilt. And that part has taken a lot longer. So, but we are imbuing it with autonomy. Um, there's some other things. We, you know, we, we had a Polaris Ranger. This was a teleop application. A very compressed schedule, um, you know, six months. We had to get, an, get this ATV. Um, drop-in actuators. Um, there's a little box on the back. On the website, I th our website, I think you can see, it's like a little jack-in-the-box. There's like this scissor lift that comes up. We were never told what would be on that scissor lift. Um, we just assumed it was a giant, you know, bunny or something. But um, it probably wasn't. Um, and, uh, but, but, it, but, you know, we did make this six-wheeler autonomous fairly quickly, leveraging the same libraries and, and, um, that, that we had used for the, the Grand Challenge. So, and Then there were some other examples, an autonomous harvester. We took a go-kart, modified that. Um, now, these are some of the smaller robots and, uh, that we've been working with. And I'm actually writing a book about, we're, I'm trying to, we're, gonna, we're open sourcing Max so that we can get it out there, let everybody use it. Um, as they wish and, and modify it as they see fit. And um, so I've been, I've been writing this book for the last three years because it's, I've been busy with other things. But these, uh, these, are the five, these are sort of five of the robots that we're going to feature in the book. And I'm gonna, I brought Rumbles here, which is, I think, the coolest of the five, um, to the conference. And I'll be talking about him tomorrow. And, but, the, but the idea here is to take the same application put similar sensors but lower. This is a $50 mobility platform. This is $200, $200, $1,500, $5,000. Um, so we'll be putting, low, you know, <coughs> Raspberry Pi, um, you know, a little better processor, uh, you know, the Pactron Jade board. Um, you know, we'll, we'll show scale in terms of all the different things. And, but it would be the same. You'll see that the same application runs on all five. Um, uh, with you know, just tweaking of configuration variables. So um, there's been some other things that we've done in terms of uh, you know kits, and some of this is just to really show okay what's you know jo that you can actually use Java to earn money in robotics and automation now as well. You know there are not a lot of Neil Young link volt cars out there to work on. There, you know, and, and there are not a lot of, and there are no more DARPA grand challenges, right? So those are showcase projects. So, and that's fun stuff. And there's not a lot of not a lot of money in selling, you know, fifty dollar hobby bots. So, you know, how to, you know how you know, but there's still a real use for Java now in, in commercial automation applications. And these are just some examples. Um, uh, we developed for these lasers a software developer's kit that makes it easy for the people um, who want to write applications using this laser, which is hard to talk to and make sense of it, to um, give them this higher level API and to talk to the different lasers. You know, a lot of companies got locked into older versions of this laser and then, you know, the same application code that talks to the older version can run now with the newer version because all that translation is handled underneath the hood. You're getting these points objects as opposed to, you know, laser specific data. Um, uh, a fusion, uh, we've done some work fusing data from GPS w um, with, with LIDAR. We've done a lot of LIDAR work. There's been a lot of commercial work in that area. Um, and so, for example, um, what, what we do is, is um, we call it Max Geo Range. You've got um, 
these lasers say on something, either a moving vehicle or in this lower right hand corner's case, an actual helicopter. And you've got GPS and inertial nav. And as the thing, the car or the, or the um, air vehicle is moving, we actually had this air vehicle here at Java 1 one year or two, 2007 maybe. And um, as, as it's moving, um, the, uh, there's an autonomous video there. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are mapping each laser point to a GPS point on Earth. And that was just showing a gimbal as well where we could also um, map, uh, you know, know, know where the angle of the laser is. Because basically this laser has a sweep like this inside. And so when you move it, it's sweeping up like this and you're getting this three-dimensional point cloud. Um, it's kind of like a very expensive Kinect sensor. <laughs> but, you know, industrial grade and, and, uh, and commonly used in a lot of commercial apps. So, um, I think there's another video. Oh yeah, this is just showing putting some, some laser on a car and scanning other vehicles. We were doing this before Google did Street View. Um, so, uh, and uh, with, um, with a mapping, uh, mapping company and it's, um, you know, it's, it's useful. <laughs> these, are some, these are things that, that aren't as sexy, per se, as, as you know, Linkfold or, or Grand Challenge, but, but um, they, they, there's, there's real commercial demand and need for this. Um, so vehicle measurement, <clears throat> we've, been, we've been pretty deep in this. Um, there, you know, uh, the question is, how do you use LiDAR overhead? These, these, on these open toll roads, you've got these in-ground loops that are detecting cars. Um, so laser is much better at detecting vehicles than these in-ground loops. Much more reliable and it's more maintainable. You don't have to dig up the pavement. You can go up and pop a laser off and replace it. And, and, and so there's a big push um, internationally, uh, but also here in the States to, to, towards this LiDAR-based uh, uh, vehicle measurement. And um, so we've developed a framework for it and we've actually fielded this to on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and we were here in 2010 with a demo of that. But basically, um, you know, as vehicles are, are traveling underneath these gantries, we're, we're detecting a vehicle, separating them. If it's a trailer, trailered vehicle, we know it's a, that's one big vehicle. Um, we're doing environmental noise filtering because it snows and it rains, and you've got to uh, get rid of those points. We can calculate the speed of these vehicles uh, more accurately than anything else. Uh, here's an example of some noise filtering. We're, we're, we're not known for our, our video um, skills, but this just shows a sort of a before and an after, and, and you can see um, you know, how that could cause problems because we're also using this to trigger cameras to tell them when to take pictures of license plates. And so if you get some spurious noise, you're going to get you know, a wrong trigger. Um, and it's also used for way in motion. We're telling th them when these vehicles are on these scales that they've got in the ground for these tractor trailers so that these tractor trailers can be traveling at, you know, highway speeds in this open tolling environment and get weighed as they're traveling without pulling over and waiting in line. Because we say, okay, you've, the, tra the tractor trailer was on, on the scale during this time period and so they just calculate the, the weights that they get from the different axles and away they go. So, there's a big demand for this, and we've been doing a lot of work in that space. We do something similar with uh, product measurement where we're measuring. Um, here's a really poor quality video, but I'm, I'm embarrassed to even show it. But this just gives you an idea. But um, we're measuring a box here. But, but we've actually done this in uh, environments where we're, we're using the lasers to, to measure products, um, their, their area volume. Um, like Al Alpac, Alberta Pacific, um, uh, up in Canada had a, an application where they wanted to measure wood chip volumes, and and so um, and so that's it's another example use. Um, and we've also <clears throat> been heavily involved with people detection, using lasers to detect people and breaches um, for security applications. We were here last year with a, a talk on that, where we also can. Can, um, you can, we can detect when someone's in a zone, and if they came through a gate and were wearing an RFID tag, we say, okay, they're allowed. If someone else comes into the zone and was not wearing an RFID tag, 
we know that they're unauthorized. So this is useful in retail applications, um, among others. So I'm going to, on, this, on the tail end, last couple slides here, just close up with some, some comments. So these are some of the, um, so there's a lot of advantages, clearly. But some of, the, um, some of the pitfalls are, as we talked about a little bit, that, um, uh, well, code written for Java SE is not easily portable to the micro level. So, you know, CLDC, for example, you know, we have developers who are like, well, why don't you just use an iterator? You know, why are you using enumeration? Well, because uh, iterators aren't in CLDC 1.1. So, so, and why don't you use, you know, this, you know, generics or something? And, and so I know that there, there are some translators to, to get you from Java 5 level uh, syntax to, and semantics to um, this lower common denominator, but we try to keep the mic, the, our, our max common common so that it can run in these different environments. So that's a pitfall. Um, there's very limited mi true microcontroller support. What's a mic you know, microcontroller like uh, an Arduino or a um, Hitachi microcontroller that they <coughs> use in bots or like some of the microcontrollers that they use in um, uh, engine control units and automobiles. Um, uh, and there's, there is limited real-time support. There is support, but, um, you know, so there is support for all this, but it's just more limited than in other, other fields. And that's why those fields tend to use, you know, C and, and other, other languages. Um, uh, but I, I think what we've done over the years is show that you can't, that, that you still can do it. It is possible. We've done real-time Java applications, and we've done microcontroller-based Java applications. And of course, there's always been this lack of these higher level libraries because it makes it tedious. So we've tried to overcome this with, with, by, building, by taking this building block approach, leveraging this lowest common denominator platform uh, with these different profiles, and also creating some, to make it useful, if it's just a platform, a platform's like a, pla it's like buying a video console without any cartridges or anything. So, you know, we, we have to create some cartridges, drivers, and, and frameworks to make it to make it useful for, for, for common things. But, it, but it's, it's open so that you know, people can write their own drivers and, and do their own things with it. So you know, the overall benefits are there's dramatically fewer lines of code to write. Um, I think I'll, if you come to my session tomorrow, um, I'll show you the code, and you'll see um, um, how little code can be written and how you can also dive in and, uh, if, if, you know, and, and, and write your own um, custom modules. Um, we, um, you know, we're leveraging tested and configurable uh, code, um, and it allows us when we're writing applications um, and uh, to focus on application logic and algorithms, like we did for the grand challenge versus low-level stuff. Um, so all the benefits for higher level, right? Um, to key, you know, time to market, lower total cost of development, and all the other things that you want to tell your management so that you can get to play with robots using Java. Um, so the path forward, I mean, we, we want to make, and we are making Macs available for open source use. Um, the, the reason why we haven't, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that, but the, uh, we want to also continue to partner with um, uh, and support device and microcontroller processor and hardware suppliers because we think there needs to be more of those uh, and partner with um, the and support real time and micro JVM vendors because we think there needs to be more of that. Um, so for 12 years, um, uh, you know, we've designed this with uh, complex and commercial real-world applications in mind. I, I came from a, um, a world of, you know, I used, I was, well, actually, I used to do some aut autonomy in the railway, but between that time and, and this time, you know, time when I got involved with this endeavor, um, I worked in the enterprise Java space. And I, so I got exposure to a lot of open source, uh, and some open source, as they call it, right? So, so the, um, so I didn't really want to, I wanted, there was a desire to prove that it's scalable and commercial first um, versus models of fielding something pedagogic and simple and then you get, you get to use it and then you realize that there's a long haul 
or some brick walls in some cases impossible to go from that hobbyist grade thing to um, something commercial or something real, you know, that, that someone's going to buy. Um, and this is especially important for robotics because there's mission criticality here. This isn't, this isn't, you know, <clears throat> these aren't websites that if something goes wrong, you know, you may lose revenue and that's terrible. But, you know, in some cases with robotics, you, you know, you may lose limbs or, or, you know, lose equipment or, or, you know, cause other damage. So there's a big safety concern here. So I want, <coughs> wanted to spend time on, um, on, on proving this first um, and, and, and um, be before we went ahead and, and just sort of threw it out there. And so, but, you know, now is the time. We're, we're, we're trying, you know, we are, we have resource limitations, but we're trying to get it out there as soon as possible. An open source form, you know, I'm writing this book. We're going to share and we want to evolve this platform. And, you know, like to all see Java pervasive in this, uh, in what's going to be an emerging market, we think. So, oh, that didn't line up right, but. <laughs> uh, how did that happen? Um, so, uh, yeah, and there was a web link. Maybe I didn't save. But um, uh, I think it's manning.com slash Perone. That, that's the early access edition of the book. Um, they have all these sort of old, the, the themes on their books have all these old, like, characters from the 1500s and 1600s. So they, they let, they gave us a waiver and they used that thing, which I don't, I don't know if, what it is, really. It just looks like a robot. But um, there's more information. Like I said, I have a session tomorrow at 8, 8 o'clock or 8.30, something like that. Robot, real world robot programming. So that's, um, that's it. So I guess we have some time for questions. Anything? Um, it's, uh, I, I, we were really trying to have it by the end of this, really trying to have it by now. Um, it's looking more like, um, realistically, the first part of next year. Just because we, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, we could put it out there, but, you know, we've got to document things and it's a couple more things and, and, uh, and not make it mis not make it a miserable experience. <laughs> I mean, we'd be happy to just put it out there, but and I, that was kind of my attitude. I'm like, well, hey, let's just put it out there, and let, and we'll tell people we're going to document some other parts of it, and we'll give some examples now. But you know, we have guys in the company who think that that's a bad idea, and they know better than me about open source. So I don't know. What do you think? Should we just put? It's a good question. Should we just put put it out there and let people download it and with like a warning, you know, this may burn your eyes out or <laughs> <laughs> alpha, you know, I, I, I would rather just put it out there, but, and put with some sample code, but then you would only be able to run those specific samples with, you know, cause they would be known the work and then, but getting outside of that, you know, but I figure a forum and putting it out there, I don't know. Any, any, any thoughts on that? Is it good to... <laughs> Better to make a first impression, but it's been 12 years. <laughs> any question? Yes. For tradi do we have any support for in in traditional industrial robots? Um, we have we have not worked with um, well, we did some work with GE Fanuc a while ago and some of their uh, industrial uh, arms, but a lot of what we've done has been focused. A lot of the applications have been focused on mobile robots. However, all of the libraries in here. Are, so we haven't built very many examples. We, we had one project a while ago, and it was preliminary. And, um, but it's, uh, you know, we've got transformations and, and things to do, like, you know, coordinate arm transformations. And, um, and you know, you're, you can control individual actuators. 
Um, so we, you can certainly control, it would certainly serve as a basis for that, but we don't have some of the, um, prob the probably that would be more of a framework, um, uh, another framework on top of this, but, um, but, but there's not, you know, the, the sensing and the controls all apply to the kinds of things that are on those industrial robots. Yes? Um, you mentioned limited real-time support. So I'm familiar with the RTSJ. I mean, in there you have support for no heat real-time bread, security, inheritance, a lot of the a lot of the things that you need, you know, real-time development, hard real-time development. Are there other things that, that are missing in there that you need for robotics? Well, we, we worked with Java RTS for a while, and we were an RTS licensee, and, and that is... Um, uh, right now is sort of in, in limbo, I think, um, in terms of its support. So uh, we have, you know, worked with some other, uh, you know, um, like for example, we had to run on QNX for a customer. And so um, there's both um, ACUS and Atigo. They both have JVMs that run on QNX. But uh, there's like not multi-core support, for example, for some, for some things, or you know, uh, there's just things that aren't aren't fully fleshed out. But but there's um, but but so we are working with them on that, and and that that's that's fine. We're working with Acus quite a bit, and um, and they're great, and um, and uh, but it, it's 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 a very small sort of space, um, and I uh, would love to see Java RTS um, sort of come back into the into the fold. So I thought that was a great, you know, we had tremendous success using it. Um, and uh, so, and it's good to have more more um, more more competition out there. But ACUS has, has done a very good job and and uh, and um, you know we so so we're we're happy with, with all the all the different you know with what with what's there. We just think that you know there needs to be more. It's not like the level of support that there is for Java SE, for example, but the, you know everybody who is supporting it is incredibly talented and smart, and, and works very hard. So um, there is that you've got just this you know high quality support, but but you know limited limited resources and bandwidth. Yes. So how much of uh, algorithmic support do you have? Do you have machine learning algorithm? Um, this is so. The question is, how much algorithm level support do we have? Like, do you have do we have machine learning? Um, this is this platform is more for, you know it's more of a platform for some of the lower level tedious stuff, right? Um, we do have some base like in Max UGV, for example, which is a, a framework. We have. Um, uh, what we we have this maneuver framework, which which is kind of this rule based rule engine based framework for selecting based on the state of the vehicle which maneuver to trigger for a robot. Um, so um, if that's kind, of, we have some rule based s stuff uh, for 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 both maneuver control and for and for sensation of of things like determining whether something's an object or not. There's some rule based. Um, Struct frameworks in there. Um, so machine learning would be an example of something that would be a great sort of add-on or, or framework on top of this as opposed to something that would be necessarily baked in per se because of its, uh, its nature. Yes? So the question is, there's a lot of talk about driverless cars and, um, and are any of these inst institutions that are creating these vehicles, uh, is there any commonality, common frameworks? And I actually happen to be, I'm the chairman of the SAE standard for on-road autonomous vehicles. So, um, you know, all the major auto manufacturers, the research institutions involved with this, including Google, are part of this committee. And... Um, 
and uh, we don't talk about implementation per se in, in the standards committee. Um, it's kind of verboten, but the um, but what I see is what I see generally in the in, in the world is is that um, especially with the OEMs, I mean, there's a, there's there is no real sharing. It's just you know developing proprietary uh, solutions um, for for driverless vehicles. But I think there could be a component market. But it's it's very you know it's very young and and, you, and there's just tremendous liability involved, right? So. If you use something from another vendor and a, you know and there's an accident, who's responsible? And so it's 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 tougher in that sense. So I don't see a lot of sharing there. All right. Well, thank you very much. I will. Uh, I am around at the conference. I have my contact info there. And again. Um, if you want to drop by a, t a talk tomorrow and look at some actual code and look at a robot, I encourage you to do so. Should be fun. Hopefully, he'll work. It's either spectacular uh, disaster or <laughs> miraculous uh, operation.